today I'm going to be presenting some of my PhD research that investigates metal use in the Arctic. Uh, in particular, uh, I'll be discussing the extent, intensity, and nature of Lake Dorset metal use and exchange. But uh, I highlight nature because that'll be the uh, aspect that I'll be uh, diving into as much as I can today. Uh, but before I get into the data, I'll first just briefly explain a little bit of background about uh, the Lake Dorset just so we're all on the same page. Uh, they exist in the Arctic from about AD 500 to 1300, and the name uh, Lake Dorset is an archaeological term. Uh, they have no living descendants, so we don't actually know uh, what they're called, which is fairly uncommon um, for uh, people that were living um, um, not too long ago. This is a really complex culture history chart uh, of the Arctic. Each uh, column represents a different uh, region, but the main uh, thing to focus on is that uh, the Dorset, or the late Dorset, I should say, was sort of the terminal end of this uh, really long, uh, multiple thousand year phase of uh, Arctic uh, occupation. Uh, and the reason for their disappearance uh, is real, has not been resolved in the archaeological record just yet, so uh, there's no real sense why they disappeared. Uh, the main dis distinguishing features of what makes the late Dorset especially uh, compared to uh, the later Inuit, is the technologies that they didn't have. Uh, in particular, uh, they didn't have a bow and arrow, so all the holes that they um, perforated into their objects were gouged, not drilled. Uh, and the other two limit, or not limitations, but at, at absent technologies uh, that they had are related to mobility, which is important for what I'll be talking about today. Uh, first off, they didn't have uh, dog sleds, or they didn't even have uh, 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 sled dogs. Uh, there's almost no evidence for dogs in the archaeological record from this time. And they also didn't have any sort of large watercraft. There's only very small evidence that they uh, used uh, small watercraft, and uh, there's nothing uh, conclusive. Obviously, they would have used some sort of um, boating technology, but uh, what that looked like uh, is unclear, and it uh, probably didn't resemble what uh, the later Inuit would be using. So along with this, they also didn't hunt uh, large uh, sea mammals like whales, but uh, they are still considered uh, marine mammal hunter-gatherers. And that's because almost in every uh, Dorset faunal assemblage, seal uh, makes up some uh, proportion of that. Uh, it's not expressed here uh, in these graphs, but uh, walrus also makes up a pretty uh, big portion at some sites. But obviously this is variable depending on uh, the region and the resources available. And uh, a really uh, Unique characteristic of the Dorset is the, or the late Dorset is the art that they produced, and most people that are even vaguely aware um, with this uh, time period and, and theme know about uh, late Dorset art. They generally represent animals like the caribou on the left or the polar bear on the right, but they also, especially increasingly towards the end of the late Dorset, started to represent human figures, both on non-utilitarian objects and um, utilitarian objects. Right. And I'll be talking about um, some of these objects today. Uh, I'll be uh, discussing uh, harpoon heads, which is the, the main sort of topic of my discussion. And uh, the last sort of characteristic of the Dorset is their metal use. Uh, they're the first group in the Canadian Arctic and Greenland to uh, widely use metal. They use both copper and iron. And uh, fortunately, in the case of the Arctic, there's very few uh, source or possible sources for that metal so we can actually trace it relatively easily. Uh, the two main sources, uh, the first one is uh, native copper, which is found in the central Arctic right here. Uh, and then the other source is from meteoric iron, which is found in northern Greenland at the top of the map. And, um, and that's pretty much it uh, for the sources of, of uh, native uh, metals. The other source of potential metal was through exchange with the Norse, uh, but that would have uh, happened only towards the end of uh, the Dorset sort of period of existence in the Arctic. So the vast majority of the metal that we see in existing assemblages come from uh, the native copper source and the Cape York meteorite. Uh, this map here shows a, uh, all the known sites with existing metal in them. Uh, so even from this, we can kind of get a sense of the extent already. Uh, some of these sites are thousands of kilometers away from the original source. Note the, the scale on the map. The Canadian Arctic and Greenland uh, is roughly about the same size as Western Europe. 
uh, so it's a massive distance for people to be traveling who don't have dog sleds or uh, large boats. Right. Uh, most of these sites contain only a few uh, metal objects as well, with most not being identif identifiable tools, and only a handful have uh, any number of, of or more than three or four objects. Right. Okay. Uh, to help expand our knowledge on this, uh, I investigated uh, organic objects that would have held um, end blades, be it lithic or metal. Uh, so I'll be focusing on harpoon heads uh, today. Uh, I measured the blade slot, so that's the place where the end blade is fixed to the organic support, and three different locations, which you can see here. I termed them proximal medial distal, uh, and that's to get a sense of the size of the blade slot. Uh, <coughs> previous work has done this in an Inuit context and has found that generally thinner slots exclusively held metal objects, while wider slots could hold both metal and stone. Okay. So there's three different types of harpoon heads that I'll be talking about, and they kind of represent different uh, periods. The first one is called Type G. This is a harpoon head that's found almost exclusively in Lake Dorset contexts. Uh, there's no examples from uh, earlier contexts. The next type is called Dorset Parallel. This comes from the entirety of the Dorset period, all the way from 500 BC to uh, up to 1300. And then the last broad category is all pre-Late Dorset harpoon heads. So I took all the harpoon heads found uh, in sites that have been um, dated to before the late Dorset, and they're all grouped in there. So that's the most variable uh, category. Uh, along with this, I also measured lithic and metal tools. Uh, this is a lithic M blade on the far right uh, that just gives you a sense of, of the type of object that I was measuring. I measured the, the, the basal um, thickness in three positions, mirroring what I did with the um, harpoon heads. So I'll present some of the data. Uh, it's most clearly understood looking at medial and distal. So remember that's like the midpoint and the distal most point, which also represents the point of the organic support that most likely came into contact with the blade. Uh, it'll be a scatter plot. Uh, so medial's along the x-axis, distal's along the y. Uh, it's a lot to take in. There's lots of dots there uh, of different colors. But the, the main thing to focus in on is the type G. Remember, that's the Lake Dorset harpoon head, which is almost consistently uh, thinner than all the other uh, harpoon heads. So if we look at the end blades now, these are all the lithic end blades. You don't need to really care about the regions, but it's just to show you that there's no regional differences there. I separated them through time as well and through different uh, attributes on them, and that doesn't change at all. It's pretty consistent. They all pretty much land in the same sort of spectrum. And if we overlap the type G onto this, we can actually see where they land. They're actually all fairly thinner than most of these end blades. So most of these end blades are thicker than what fits into that uh, harpoon head. There's a few exceptions here, but the bulk of the type G conform to that. If we now lay over the other harpoon heads, we can see that they actually match the lithic end blades quite well. Right. So uh, we can now add in the incredibly small um, known uh, assemblage of metal objects in the, in the dorsal assemblage. So I measured all those, and you can see that, for the most part, most of the metal tools uh, correlate well with the Type G, especially on this thinner cluster, which almost none of the uh, end blades do. So if we sum up all this data, we can actually see in most sites that have more than one uh, Type G uh, harpoon head, uh, they actually have a majority of Type G harpoon heads from that thinner cluster, which is kind of to be expected. Okay, so uh, at first these data explain well and expand the intensity and extent of metal use at first, but they have significant Im implications for the nature of it as well. So how the Dorset actually understood both the metal that they were um, exchanging and why they were exchanging it. Right, so ultimately this helps us understand a little bit more about how the late Dorset engaged with their things. I think defer to approach this, we have to shift our ontological perspective. I'm basing much of my discussion today on Amerindian perspectivism by Viveros de Castro, uh, and I don't really have time to go into it today, uh, but the basic uh, tenets of it is that um, the framework basically says that the human non human division that exists in most Western ontologies is probably not the case for most people in the world. Uh, in particular, uh, some people. 
of view humans, animals, and things as equal beings. This is well supported in circumpolar nor north ethnography, where, for example, the traditional beliefs of the Inuit uh, state that humans and animals have souls, as do other things like objects, stones, and rivers. The perspective has already been applied in Dorset context by Matthew Betts and colleagues. They specifically analyzed a large number of polar bear effigies in the late Dorset, or in late Dorset context, and argued uh, that they were mnemonics to help the Dorset understand who they really were. By this, they mean that the Dorset viewed the polar bears in both, as both competitors and also as personal threats. Betts et al. argue that the Dorset worldview shifted uh, through repeated interaction with these polar bears. The carvings would then uh, capture this experience. Things northern people, uh, though, can be uh, more than just things to help them order their world, but also the objects themselves can have a soul or a spirit. The uh, Yukagir of Siberia, for example, a traditionally crafted Eoya, which uh, is a human-like uh, carving that is said to represent and protect the hunter well in the dream world. The important takeaway from these two examples uh, is that the objects can be act as mnemonic devices that show connection uh, between humans and other non-humans, but also that these objects themselves may be persons. So moving on to the Dorset, therefore, uh, I think it is a product of viewing um, the, specifically the metal end blades uh, as active signs of connection and livelihood. More than, uh, more than just a, a component part of a complex composite object, which is the harpoon, the end blade symbolized the Dorset world. By holding the end blade in their hand, or perhaps fixing it to their harpoon head, the Dorset held their whole community. Recall the limited source regions uh, that I talked about for metal. Uh, when we consider where type G are found, as uh, seen here in yellow, uh, it is clear that the bulk of the examples are hundreds of kilometers, and in some cases thousands of kilometers away from the nearest source, uh, and where the end blade effectively began its life. The lack of certain mobility technologies meant that if these type G harpoon heads do actually represent metal use, then, this would affect, then these would have effectively been walked to their exchange, net, exchange network from source to final deposition. Along the way, the material would build their itinerary or biography of where they've been, uh, both through time and space. One characteristic of the late Dorset, as well as the presence of large aggregation sites called longhouses, there's one image there. These are massive, up to 45 meter long, um, multi-family uh, dwellings that exist only at this time period and um, have been sort of interpreted as a nexus for trade. So uh, in, in many ways, these longhouses uh, could be vectors of exchange and undoubtedly metal must have flown, flowed through them. Uh, significantly, type G are found in higher frequencies at longhouses, despite sea mammals, especially seals, perhaps being slightly less represented. Along with this, there's higher frequencies of trade materials like uh, jade and quartz crystal. Uh, Fitzhugh argued that, a lands that in a landscape not heavily uh, populated, early Inuit groups had to make uh, concerted efforts to people this landscape and give it meaning. One method of doing this was to create a neck suite, which both acts as navigational aids in some cases, but also as persons or stories in the landscape for the Inuit to interact with. A neck suite literally means uh, that which acts like a person. The Dorset had no equivalent, though. Uh, However, uh, I argue that it's because they did not people their landscape with stone monuments, but rather with the objects they held in their hand. Uh, through the exchange of these objects and the cumulative itineraries they possessed, whether this was known to the individual or not, created a physical link within the Dorset communities through time and space. So to conclude, uh, the proxy data show that a higher intensity of metal use was being used than previously thought. In particular, uh, type G harpoon heads seem to be predominantly held uh, ex he or type G harpoon heads predominantly held exclusively metal end blades, and these harpoon heads are spread throughout the Arctic. Uh, while I didn't go into much uh, detail, the limited experimental work that does exist in North America comparing uh, native copper versus uh, stone projectile point efficiency shows that there's actually a very little difference between the two material types. Furthermore, being that stone is much more accessible than any given Dorset group, the opportunity cost of using metal seems way too high unless that metal was exchanged frequently, and more importantly, perhaps that it carried more uh, social value uh, beyond its functional capabilities. This can only be re uh, appreciated by viewing the end blades as objects that were viewed not only as things, uh, uh, not only as things that were persons in their own right, 
but also as things that accumulated these associations through repeated interaction, much as Betts uh, and colleagues argue that polar bears, uh, much like Betts et al. argue about polar bears and the effigies associated with them. Uh, without this active role in late Dorset worldview, it is unlikely that these distributions that I've shown uh, would, be, would look as it does. On the same note, without this robust uh, data set that I've presented regarding metal, metal proxy use, this aspect of the late Dorset worldview would not be known. It's through uh, th these vectors of uh, metal exchange that traveled the knowledge of oral histories. And in conclusion, these metal objects then uh, that no longer exist by a group whose name we don't know uh, were used for creating the world and telling themselves who they are. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.